This, this really isn't a, a talk about the API itself. I will have a couple of introductory pieces to it. But it's really about the, the, a talk about the internals of the data store. What tools we use to build it, uh, how we organize data, that kind of stuff. So what is it? It's an open source distributed time series metrics and events database. We say all three because you can use it for any one of those things. The key thing is it's for things that are arranged by time. Uh, and essentially, you can use it as the backend data store for a lot of analytic style workloads. So they could be operational analytics, they could be user analytics, that kind of stuff. So the data model of it is you have databases, uh, then you have time series, which can be roughly equated to like tables in SQL. But the difference is you could have hundreds of thousands of time series or millions of time series, and you'd never have that in SQL, right? Uh, you, don't all, you also don't have to define them ahead of time. It's not like you have a schema where you say, these time series exist and these are their columns. It just gets defined as you write the data in. So then you have points, which are kind of like rows. But the difference is it's more column oriented. We don't store null values. So if you have a time series where you have like say 30 columns, but on most of the time you're only writing in like three of those values, it doesn't waste extra like hard drive space keeping null values on disk. So the primary API to this thing is all HTTP based. Uh, you can do a post to this endpoint, you specify the database name in it, uh, you specify a username and password either in the query parameters or in basic auth and then you give it uh, a JSON blob, which is just a collection of objects. Uh, we'll dive into that in a second. Queries are a get against this endpoint, and you pass it in this you know, username and password, and this queue equals, and it's some string. So we have a query language that's specifically designed for this. So here's what the data looks like. You have a collection of objects. So here we have a single series called CPU, it has three columns, time, value, and host. And then we have two points that we can see organized in time descending. Um, from this, we can see time is there. Time is actually a special built-in column that's always there. Even if you don't specify a time, a time will be written in for you uh, because that's how it's indexed. Uh, you can have double values, integers, or strings, or booleans. So here, we're feeding in data, and we're not specify specifying a timestamp. Uh, it actually gets specified for you. Come on in. <laughs> um, so the, the other thing to note here is that you don't even necessarily have to have like double values in a time series. Most people, when they think of time series, they think of uh, discrete measurements at intervals of time. Uh, like 10 seconds or a minute or whatever, and it's really always just like a value. So it would be like your response time or your average CPU load or, uh, or a temperature or if you have like external sensor data or whatever. Uh, in this, you could just be feeding in strings and counting those things later. So here's the, the query language we designed is it's kind of like SQL. Uh, we, we thought that would be easier for people to understand is like a SQL style query language. It's not exactly SQL. It's a subset plus some extra stuff. So here we're grabbing all the columns from some series uh, for, for all the points for the last hour. Uh, we have a lot of built-in aggregate functions. I'm not gonna go, th I, I don't have examples of all of them, but really quickly it's min, max, mean, uh, standard deviation, histogram, percentiles, um, derivative, uh, a few others, like first and last. So in this example, we're grabbing the 90th percentile values from some series uh, in 10 minute buckets for the last day. So what we get out of this is six times 24 points, discrete points, in at demarcated at 10 minute intervals. And those would be the 90th percentile values. You can select from multiple series at the same time by selecting from a regular expression. So any series name that matches that regular expression will be included. So here we're just grabbing the most recent data point from 
every series that matches stats.cpu. You can also have string values as the columns. Um, so that, that, makes for, that makes it so you can do interesting things with like, you can feed your logs into this and log lines into it. And you can do things like, oh, let's look at the log lines for this day and look for error. Uh, and it will just grep through, if you, if you had like one data point per log line, it would just like grep through all those points and return the points that match that. And then the, the last bit I'm gonna cover just like the basic API before I dig into the internals is uh, something we'll call continuous queries. So continuous queries are how we do optimization. We're only indexing things by the series and the timestamp. So there are no secondary indexes. If you want to create additional time series that are faster to look up on, you can use this like fan out feature uh, which basically like denormalizes the data. It just creates duplicates of the data. So in this case, we have a series called events and we have a column called user ID. And what we're doing here is we're creating a separate time series for each unique user ID. So we still have the events time series, but as we pump in data, it will create separate time series for each individual user, which makes it very efficient to look up like the series for a, any given user. Uh, so then the other thing continuous queries are, for, are good for is for downsampling and summary data. So in this example, we have events, say we have page ID, which is the thing we wanna count. So it could be like the hits in one hour increments and we're doing it for each unique page ID. So basically that, that keyword into, into tells the cluster that this is gonna be a continuous query. It's gonna be something where we're not running the query and returning a result. It's we're taking this and we're running it continually in the background on the cluster. Um, I'll dig into the details of how that actually works. In this case, what we get is uh, for each unique page ID, we'd get a time series called events.patchid and there'd be a tick once an hour uh, for, of the count for that, for that hour. So you can pair that up with uh, things like the selecting from a regex to just say like create a standard where we know we're gonna want to have like the max value from any series that begins with stats in five minute increments fed into we say max dot colon series name. So before this bracket page ID tells it to interpolate whatever the column value <laughs> is into the resulting series name here colon series name interpolates whatever the series was that selected from into the resulting series name. Okay, so now we're gonna get into like the, the underlying details, how, how we, what things we use to put all this together. So the query language is like, it looks like SQL, but it's not quite. We used uh, Flex and Bison, which are tools that people use for, usually for, for building compilers and programming languages we use them to build a lexer and a parser for our, for our query language. Um, the query processing code is like totally custom. We, we wrote it from scratch. Everything's written in Go, um, except for obviously these things. These generate C code, which then we wrap in Go to, to create like Go objects for the, for the query stuff. Um, but we had to hand code all the aggregate functions and all the conditional logic and stuff like that. So, okay, now how data is organized in InfluxDB. So it's, it's time series data um, and it's a distributed database. So we had to make a decision about how, you know, how do we decide what data lives where? And originally we had started with this thing that was like um, consistent hashing, uh, which is what Cassandra uses to decide where rows go. Um, and it didn't really work well for our use case for, for time series data. So what we landed on instead was the idea of a shard. So a shard is a contiguous block of time of data. So here we have an ID, we have a start time, we have an end time, and we have a list of server IDs. So each one of those server IDs that has the shard contains a full copy of that shard. So it's totally redundant for this 
particular block of time. Uh, so that has interesting implications for how queries work. So right now we're going to work through like the the dumb example. So we're going to assume all the time series database time series data in the database for a given block of time maps to a single shard. Now that's one way to operate it. Uh, you can actually scale out in a different way, which I'll talk about in a second. But here, let's just say, if we look up uh, a block of time, we know that all the data lives on this shard. So that shard is what we can query. So if we look at this query here, which is select the count of values from foo, sometimes series, grouped by five minute intervals. Well, we didn't specify a time, so we pretty much have to hit every single shard in the database to answer this query. So it's, it's distributed, so shards can live on multiple servers. So say server A is the server that gets the query. It distributes the query out to all the shards. Now some of those shards could live on server A, but they could live on other servers. And how it works is at the shard level, it computes that, that value locally. So it runs through the raw points, computes count, and then sends the single tick for the five minute interval back to server A. So those results get streamed back to server A, which then collates them and puts them in the right time order and sends them back to the client. Uh, so I have a question. Yeah. How is, how is the key generated? What do you mean the key? Like is there a, is there a, um, um, a particular key, like, like something to join? Oh, uh, well, so you're selecting from a specific time series. Okay. okay, so this is poorly named in this example, but this is like, I called it foo. I should have called it like user events or log lines or something like that. So that's the key that we're looking up. And you can do other things, like you can say where some column equals x. Uh, to, to further filter down the query. You can't do joins like you do in a SQL database. Um, it's really like, think of it like you have a stream of events and you can run some sort of aggregate function across the stream and filter it based on different conditions. Um, so the implications for how this query stuff works is the shards are how we scale things out. More shards on more servers means you get better scalability in terms of how many data point, how many raw data points you can churn through to do any any query. Uh, group by times less than the shard interval gives you data locality. Here you see we're computing that count locally and then sending only the computed tick back up to the server. Uh, so the other possibility, the other potential thing is that because all these shards get queried in parallel, there's no guarantee on which one returns first. So we could get all the old results first, and then we'd have to buffer all those in memory because when server A returns a response to the client, it has to return them in the right time order. Um, so if you do something on your query where you specify a time on it, the query gets evaluated when it comes in to server A, and we say, oh, we know this time interval lives on this shard, so we'll just query this single shard, get the result, send it back to the client. So it's much more efficient to look up, and it's, it's faster. Um, so really, we evaluate the query and hit only the shards we need to answer it. So the thing about data locality. Uh, This query here, we have select count of value from foo. We don't specify a time interval at all. So we're just going from, for all time. And the problem with that is the way things are right now, uh, we are not, we're not doing intermediate values for, for count. Like this is definitely much more of a problem with things like percentiles or quantiles. Um, so server A will distribute that query, but instead of computing like an intermediate result, they will just stream all the raw data points back to server A, which then has to compute the result and send it back. So it just means that all the raw data is going to go over the network to the server that initially got the query. 
OK. So the, the part I mentioned about um, shards being like all, assuming all the data for a given time interval is every time series for, for a shard. That's true in one configuration, but you can actually configure it to scale out. Uh, so here's the conf what the configuration for the shard stuff looks like. You have a duration of time. You have split, which is for any given duration, how many shards should we create? And you have a replication factor, which is for every shard, how many servers should it live on? How many, how many servers should have a copy of that shard? So replication factor is, is this piece. It's the server IDs. And that's how we achieve read scalability, right? Um, if you have 20 servers that have, this, have a copy of the shard, any one of those servers can answer a query for that shard. Now, the split piece really comes into play for, for shard creation. So here's what the, what the pipeline looks like for when we create a shard. We have this point that we're writing in uh, to server A. We check, we, we put it in a time bucket, and we say, is there a shard for this time bucket? If not, then go create the shards. Now, in the example I had, we had a replication fact, we had a split, sorry, of three so what that means is for this time bucket, we're going to create three shards that store all the data for that time bucket. Now the question becomes, OK, if we have three shards for a time bucket, how do we know what data is in which of those shards? Right? And here's, here's how we figure that out. We look up a time bucket. And all of this is kind of, it's, it's like configuration metadata that every server in the cluster knows about. So we look up the time bucket, and we say, oh, there are n number of shards that have the data for this bucket. Now, the naive algorithm, or the, the default algorithm is the, the for else part, which is we do a hash of the database in the series, mod the number of shards, and that will get us the shard that has that, the data for that series, for that period. So what that means is, you get, you can be sure with that algorithm, you can be sure that all the data for a given series for a specific window of time lives on one shard. So you can get data locality out of that. You can do like quick aggregate functions across it. But what that also means is for your hot shards, like generally with time series data, unless you're doing a bulk load of historical stuff, you have now as the, the bucket of time that is hot. So you're writing to those all the time. Uh, so if you have split of 10, but you have a cluster size of 100 servers, at any given time, only 10 servers are actually actively taking in the writes. Um, and even worse, for a specific series, it's always mapped to one server that's actively taking in those writes. Or two servers if you have a replication factor of two, but they're both taking every single write. Uh, so we have a way to override that for time series that have many, many data points, like more than you'd want to write to a single server. Uh, and that's this regular expression piece, which is this split random thing in the config. And basically, it just means you have a regular expression that you can specify. And whenever you're writing data in, it will look at the series name and evaluate it against the regex. If it matches, then it will just randomly distribute the data uh, to one of the shards in that time bucket. So what that means is you get, you get really good write scalability um, for those at the cost of no data locality when you're doing a query. When you're doing a query, say you have a certain window of time split into three separate shards. Any query against that window of time will have to hit all three, pull the data over the network, and then run the computation before you can get an answer. Um, and so one of the other things is that all the servers know about all the other shards. They know about what their windows of time are. They know about the, which servers in the cluster have those shards. Uh, but it also means that those rules can change over time, 
with time series data, like old historical data, it's generally cold. So you, it's cold as far as writes are concerned. It's hot for reads, but it's cold for writes. So you don't have to worry about like splits and stuff like that. So if you start out and one server can easily handle all the writes you're dealing with, and then you start scaling up, you can change the split value later and the whole thing will just work because it knows for these windows of time, there was only one shard. And then for these later windows of time, there were two. Uh, and in, in a release that we're going to do, uh, the 060 release, which we'll be pushing out sometime this month, uh, you'll be able to manually copy shards from one server to another, which will give you a couple of things. One, it'll make it easy to replace down nodes. Like, so if a node goes down and it's just not coming back, you can spin up a new system in the cluster and just copy all the shards that it had from the other nodes in the cluster that has it. Uh, but it also means that you can dynamically update the replication factor. If you have a specific window of time that's very, very hot for your reads, you can copy the shard over to other servers mm -hmm. so that many servers can answer those queries. And then later on, when, when those become cold, you can actually delete it and clear it out. So we give you like the tools to like manually control where data lives in the cluster. It's, it's a lot, we give you a lot more knobs and, and tools to move around data than you would get in like HBase or Cassandra, right? Because everything in those are kind of like automatically mapped for you. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the storage engine that we use. So each shard maps to a LevelDB instance. LevelDB is uh, an embedded database. It's basically a library. Um, and it's an ordered key value hash. So we use that to basically put in time series data. We use the fact that the key space is ordered so that we can order sequences of points. So here's what our keys look like. They're 24 bytes uh, in three different eight byte segments. The ID, which is eight bytes, and that uniquely identifies a database a series and a column, uh, which means all the values for a column are in a contiguous block in the key space. Then there's time, which is a microsecond epic. It's, uh, we normalize it to be positive so that range scans work. Um, so again, all the, all the values for a given column uh, in their time are organized in, in time sequence. Uh, and then finally, there's a, a sequence number. So we added a sequence number in because we wanted uh, InfluxDB to be useful for events data. And with events data, you can have events with the exact same timestamp, which you can't have in a round robin database like uh, Graphite or RRD, right? Uh, so sequence number is just a thing that we use to make sure that they don't collide with each other. Uh, it's a UN64. The first three digits in the sequence number are uh, an ID that uniquely identifies the server within the cluster. So it means that writes can come in to any server in the cluster, and they are able to assign sequence numbers to points without coordinating with the other servers to figure out you know, what's a unique sequence number. So under the covers, here's like what the, what the ordered key space might look like. So these are normally bytes, but I'm showing like the integer values to make it more readable. Um, we have a point at, top, at the top that we're writing in. It has two columns in it. Um, so here we can see column one and column two. The parts in green, we see the timestamp and the sequence number are the same. So that's actually the exact same point in the two different column keys. Here, the two that are adjacent to each other have the same timestamp, but a different sequence number. So it's a different point, but with the same timestamp. The values are just bytes. We use protobuf both for our intra-cluster communication as a serialization protocol, uh, and also for what we store in the database. So here's like what a value looks like. You can see you can have a string, a double, a Boolean. Um, or an integer. 
Uh, and the integers in protobufs are variable length encoded. So if you're writing in a lot of ones or twos or whatever, they, take, uh, they don't take a full uh, 64 bits. Um, and then the last one is for us, for intra-cluster intra communication, we don't actually store nulls. So if we see is null is true, we just throw it away. We don't store it. So what are the implications of like this underlying storage schema? It means aggregate queries do range scans for the entire time range, which you would expect on like percentiles and stuff like that. You may not expect that on uh, counts or, or like min or max or whatever. We don't do any indexing on that kind of stuff. So you, whatever the, the time range is that you specify, we scan over those points. Where clauses do a, a range scan for the entire range as well. So if you have some string value and you're matching against this and this other time range, it's going to scan all the points of that time range uh, to look for, for points that match that. Um, and so then the other piece is that queries against multiple columns will do multiple range scans. You'll do a range scan for every single column that you're querying. So if you do something like select value from some series where tag equals you know, host A, it's actually going to scan through all the points. Um, it's going to do two scans, one through, through tag and then one through the, through the actual values. So really what that means is that if you want to get better performance, where you're not doing range scans over a lot of stuff, splitting things into many separate time series are the way to get better performance and the way to index things. Uh, also, because of the way the sequence numbers are, there's a hard cap. You can't have any more than 999 servers within a cluster. Uh, so to have a big cluster of servers, doing all that communication for multiple raft groups seems like it would be uh, very problematic. Uh, and the raft implementation we worked with, we're working with, doesn't have any of that built in. It doesn't have like the idea of like raft groups. There's really just the cluster. So this is what it looks like when a server joins a cluster. If you have one server, you start it up, and you have other servers that you can point to any server in a cluster through this seed servers configuration option. They start up, they connect via raft, and they say, hey, I want to join. If, it's, if the server they connected to isn't the leader, they get redirected to the leader. They join the cluster. And then they get all the log data replayed to them from the leader. And the leader also tells all the other servers, hey, this server joined. So then they all connect to the new server, and the new server all con connects to all of them via TCP. So our, our TCP protocol is uh, it's protobuf based. So every server has a connection to every other server in the cluster. Um, and we, we multiplex the request responses onto this single connection. We don't do a thing where like we have connection pools and we, we do like request, response, request, response. We just pipe requests in and read responses uh, out on a separate thread and use IDs to map them back together. Uh, so this TCP protocol is what we use for the distributed queries and it's what we use for writes. Here's what the request object looks like. So this is a, a protobuf definition. You can use this and generate a file, which is basically like what you can use to parse the, the, the bytes, the binary bytes, or generate the bytes for a request. And there we can see we have a write, we have a query, and we have heartbeats. So we send heartbeats through to make sure so that the servers know what other servers are up in the cluster so that when a query comes in, they can route that query to a server that's up and able to handle it. Uh, here's what a response looks like. We have a query. We have a write OK. We have the heartbeat um, explain query. So for any query that you can issue, you can put explain in front of it, and it will give you information about uh, what shards were hit, how many data points it ran through, and how long each of those took to return. Uh, and then finally, the, the end stream one, which is important. Um, because 
as I, as I mentioned, some of the queries, like you're piping raw data back, like the raw data points back to the server that has to run the computation. Uh, if you do a query where you're reading in like a billion data points, you don't want to put that into a single response. So we, it's a streaming protocol where you do chunks and it can compute the chunks as they come in. And the end stream just says, hey, I'm done. I'm not sending you any more data. So the right's going over the, the TCP protocol. The real question is like, how do we ensure replication? How do we sure, ensure that they actually succeed? For this, we have a, a write ahead log, which is like most databases have this, pretty much all. Uh, and the idea is that it ensures that you can you, you, you can have a, a durable operation, right? So a write comes in to server A, we log it to the wall, and then we send a uh, success back to the client immediately. And then what we do is we send it to the places that it needs to get written to. It could be a local shard, it could be a remote server, it could be 10 remote servers if your replication factor is very high. Um, with each one of those writes, as it finishes, it writes a commit message into the wall. Once all of the, the people who are supposed to get the write have committed, then the wall knows they can at that point truncate and get rid of the old data. So really what we're using the wall for is to, to deal with failures. So if a server goes down or it starts, if it gets, starts getting slow, um, we need to be able to protect against that. We need to be able to just spool those writes to disk and then when it comes back up, replay them from our last known commit. Uh, which means that we don't, we don't need to buffer all the writes in memory. So one of the things like, when you're dealing with distributed systems and you're dealing with like writes and stuff like that, uh, you can have a problem where one server can go down and another server that's like buffering writes to that server just backs up and backs up until you fill up all your memory and then you get like a cascading failure because they were all just like waiting for this one other server to come come back up. In this case, they'll just send it to disk. And then when that server comes up, they'll replay off disk onto that server. Uh, and then the other nice thing is that with the wall, we don't have to write into LevelDB directly. So LevelDB is a log structured merge tree, which means there are sometimes delays when you're running a compaction in the database. Uh, so it can cause your worst case performance to be you know, really bad. You can get like a couple second delay. Um, with this, if you have a big enough uh, write buffer, um, it means, actually it, it doesn't matter like what your write buffer size is, it, it won't block. Like your, your worst case performance is still gonna be pretty good because it's just spooling the data to disk and immediately returning a response. Does yeah. Assuming that your data is not available for query until it's uh, actually been moved into LevelDB? Uh, the question was, does this mean your data isn't available for query until it's actually been moved into LevelDB? The answer is yes. In practice, that is instant, it's like very, very quick. Um, it's sub millisecond. Um, unless you're having problems with the server that you're writing data into. Okay, so this is this last bit of like internal pieces. Uh, so continuous queries, I mentioned, it's for it's for denormalization for duplicating data to get better query performance. It's for downsampling. Uh, they're distributed, and all the data is replicated through Raft. So what that looks like is if you create a query, a continuous query, it doesn't run, like it just creates it in Raft, which gets replicated, replicated out to all the other servers. Now, Raft is a consensus protocol, so nothing will get committed until, all, until a quorum of the, the servers have committed that. But it also means that if you have some servers that are misbehaving, they could not get your continuous query right away which really for fan out queries, that's the only thing you have to worry about. So this is like, again, the fan out query where you say, oh, we're gonna take this event series and we're gonna create many other series based off the specific users. So looking at the right pipeline again, 
we need to go back and update this with continuous queries in mind. So here's what it looks like actually with continuous queries, which is you write the data to server A, it logs to the wall, returns success, and then we evaluate fanouts, and then everything gets committed. So under, underneath, this is what a fanout might look like. Yeah? Oh, no. Uh, so here we have uh, foo metric, um, some, some value that we're writing in. Uh, we have a time, a sequence number, a value, and a host. In the fan out, we're creating a separate time series per host value. Um, and what we can see there from the spot highlighted in green is that the time and the sequence number of the fanned out point are exactly the same as the source point, um, which is nice for a couple of reasons. Uh, it means that when you have fan out points, you, and you, if you know what the source series was, you can look up the source point. So if you're, only, if you're fanning out, but you're only keeping like one of the columns, and maybe the source series has like 20 with a bunch of extra data, you can then query that point directly. And querying any individual point is very efficient. It's just a key lookup, because it knows the ID, the time, and the sequence number, which is the key that we're looking for. Uh, but it also means that failures in the middle of a fan out are fine. So if a write comes in, uh, we log it to the wall, and we say we had like three fan outs we were supposed to do on this particular write, and it did one of them, and then it failed. When the server, when, and the server died, when the server comes back up and it replays from the, from the commit log from the wall, it's fine that it rewrites those previous points that it had fanned out because it just updates them in place because we're setting the time and the sequence number. We're not assigning like new sequence numbers to fan outs. Uh, okay, now the summaries, which work a little bit differently. So we call them continuous queries, but the truth is for the, for the summary stuff, they don't run all the time in the background. It's more like they check occasionally whether or not they have to run. And actually, it's the RAF leader in the cluster that does this check. So every second, it just says, hey, do I have any continuous queries to run? And it keeps track. The, the RAF metadata that gets replicated to all the other servers, they keep track of when the last successful run of continuous queries was. So they run those queries, then they mark the, the time, which gets replicated through RAF, and then you keep going. So here's what that looks like. We have a continuous query at the top where we're grabbing the counts in one hour buckets of each unique page ID. Um, so basically every hour on the hour, it will run this query and it will add a where time to the query to scope it by the last hour of data. Now you can actually configure when, how far behind these continuous queries lag. So sometimes, you know your, your data collection lags behind by like five minutes or whatever. You can say, don't compute the, the continuous query data for this until like 10 minutes past whatever the time range was. Uh, so here we see we have a fan out and it assigns a time, which is the, the bucket time, and a sequence number. And for the sequence numbers for downsampled data, we actually start with the sequence number of one and go up from there. We don't have that unique server ID thing because we always know that it's being run on the leader. There's one server running it. But what that means is all this continuous query stuff, the downsampling stuff is fault tolerant across like server failures. If the leader dies in the middle of a run, a new leader will get elected and it'll just pick up from the last point that it was run. If the continuous query run had gotten halfway through, it'll end up recalculating those, but it'll just overwrite the previous values. It's not like you'll get like duplicate values or anything like that. Uh, yeah. All right, so one last little thing, which is something we're working on right now. Uh, well, not yet. We'll be working on it in about a week or so. Uh, I'm curious what people think of it is, um, 
custom functions, uh, which is the idea that we're, we're going to use JavaScript for this. So essentially, you'll be able to go in, write some JavaScript code that will get some points, and then emit some points, give it a name, and then create that. It'll use Raft to replicate the function across the cluster. And then at that point, you can issue a query where you call out to your custom function, uh, whatever. Um, the, uh, there are some things that I think are pretty cool about this. Since it's JavaScript, you can do whatever you want. Like you can run custom calculations, but you could also do things like trigger a webhook or something like that. Uh, so if you pair custom functions up with continuous queries, you can monitor your data either in real time or every minute or every hour or whatever um, using this custom function. So you can do like you can build monitoring into the database. Um, and then the last piece is PubSub, which is, uh, for this we'll have to do, we, we've had long had an issue open on GitHub where we, needed, we wanted to do a binary protocol. Uh, we started with HTTP because we thought it would be easiest for people to use and get started with, um, but binary, like for anything that's very high traffic, we need binary, uh, binary an efficient binary protocol. And PubSub is gonna be one of those things that, that needs this. So the idea is, you can run any type of query and you say into subscription parentheses. So say you connect to one server, you issue this query, it uses Raft to replicate this information across the cluster so that whenever a write comes in to any server in the cluster, it evaluates this query and says, oh, this client is waiting for it, sends it back to this server, which then sends it back to the client. Now the other piece is you can do, pair that up with group by time intervals so in this case, we have like group by time one minute. So what would happen is this server has that, there's a client connected to this server that has that subscription. He gets the data as it comes in and once a minute, it'll just send a tick back to the client with that information. Um, yeah. That's all I have. <laughs> so are there other questions? Um, so you were talking about before that you could dynamically Yes. So, the, so the question, sorry, the question was, uh, can you dynamically change the window size of the shards? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, so there's actually an endpoint uh, in the API where you can create shards. So right now, shards get created under the covers automatically on an as-needed <coughs> basis. So if there is no shard existing for a given time bucket that you're writing into, it will get created for you. There's nothing to stop you from creating them ahead of time. Uh, and when you create a shard, you can specify a start time, an end time, and which server should have a copy of it. So you can manually configure, like if you know like you have a certain server configuration, you want these shards to be here, these shards to be here. Uh, we will be adding tools later on to do things like collapse shards together and stuff like that. So if you wanted it's that's useful for cold data, particularly like where you're not actively writing into that that time range. It's nice. Um, yeah. Sorry. Was there another one? Time ranges static themselves, or like the bucket, like time buckets, or can that be resized too? So the the question is: Are the time ranges static themselves the, for the bucket, or can they be resized? Right now, um, I mean nothing. Right now, for existing shards, they can't be resized. Like, whatever their time range is, that's what it is. But if you change the duration, like say you start out with like seven day shards and you're just writing in a ton of data and you're like, okay, we're gonna go down to one day shards. The next time, if you're writing in only new data, the next time you get to the point where it rolls over, it would create a shard size of a day. Uh, same, same thing if you updated the split value uh, if you had started off with one and later you change it to like five, when it creates the new shard, it will, it will or the new bucket, it will create five shards for that, for that bucket. Does that impact the queryability of, of data before the change happened? Does it impact the queryability of data before the change happened? No. Uh, so when a query comes in, uh, it's evaluated mm -hmm. against 
what the actual shards are, and it says, okay, it will, it will impact if you, so if you had like a shard size of a day, and then you suddenly like drop down to a shard size of an hour, and you had a bunch of queries running where you were doing group by time intervals of like four hours, you would lose data locality. So you could potentially affect your, your read, your query performance by going to smaller shard sizes where you have a bunch of queries that are that cross that boundary. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Thanks, everyone.